My name is uh, Nina Monday. I'm the manager of Five Centre for Equality. So before we actually go into the presentation about the data that we have uh, within Five Centre for Equality, so I thought just to give you some background information about uh, the organisation. If you haven't heard of us, that's perfectly fine because we only just started 2014. And unlike many kind of like voluntary organisation, the need wasn't identified by the communities. Actually, the creation of Five Centre for Equalities was created by Five Council. It was the local authority that identified that there's a need for an organisation who can look after all the equality interests within Five. You know, because there's been, in, um, in the past, there's been uh, various uh, uh, organisations kind of looking after different strands, but they felt with the Equality Act and it be more advantageous for an area like Fife to have an organisation that look at the all nine protected characteristics. And I, will, I can go into that later as well. So, so we are set up to really to make Fife a fairer place to live, work and study. So that's the aspiration for almost every single local authority uh, in Scotland. Our job is not there to, to really deliver any particular services but we're here to inspire and enabling people to take action. So it is about that mainstreaming. So rather than seeing equality as an add-on or a separate thing, it's actually how do we incorporate that into everything that people do in their daily life. And it's about people taking action so everyone has the responsibility. And we're also here to try to create this harmonised and collective voice. So, because within the equality movement, often you will have groups that are speaking of one issue and, and then they all want to be heard and they all want to be seen that their issue is actually a lot more important or have been neglected. Um, so, so we're trying to, our best to find what are the common themes that are affecting all the different protected groups. And it's about championing equality, diversity, inclusion and social justice together. So I think some of the values that uh, we have very much mirror what the open government, uh, the data sharing, you know, it's about honesty, integrity, about respect. And we're hoping that everybody that we work with share those values as well. And then so because of that, and one of the key things that we do is about knowing what data we have and how to go about sharing those data because I think it is important that, you know, a lot of things is about helping people to make informed decisions. And, and I think within the, I mean, uh, not focusing on the PB, but using PBA as an example, I think there are a lot of data that we have, but we don't often use. So while, rather than saying who's engaging with us, as in who turned up at the events, we, we should have some data that we should know about who's not engaging and what data we don't have. And so at that point, I'm going to tra transfer that over to Elric, I think. Yep, that's it. Yeah. So yeah, so uh, equality data. So the first thing that, uh, if you ever try to search for it, that you'll get straight away is that it's very, very, very diverse. It means a lot of different things to everyone because depending where you are, equality means a different thing to you. So the one thing that we as an organization realize is the diversity of, of data that exists when we're trying to tackle something as abstract and high level, which is equality. First thing that you have is obviously this, the diversity. But who who uh, creates the data, who manages it, who stores it, who administers it, who releases it from time to time. That's the first thing I've acquired as I started working with Five Center for Equalities. There's just so much of it. Um, it's not necessarily done in the same way, but you need to find a way, a common theme, and you need to try and string it together. That's one thing. The second thing that we found is Silos. Seriously, you wouldn't believe how siloed some of this information is. There is a, there is a, a, a let's say, trend towards opening up and sharing information, but very, very, very quickly, 
it gets shut down. Uh, and it's quite odd in some ways because a lot of information is technically public domain. It is technically public information, uh, but it, it's not readily accessible. There's a lot of protocols, there's a lot of like try to, trying to uh, knock at doors, ask, uh, you know, this information about, let's say, uh, local, let's say, uh, disadvantaged communities, could we know a bit more about it? It becomes very difficult to get. Uh, it, there's all kinds of reasons for that. One, maybe it's in a sensitive, uh, but uh, some other levels, it might be, maybe someone is going, well, if I release that, I might look bad. I don't want to, I want, I'd rather this information just didn't surface or whatsoever. Unfortunately, that's something that still happens. I'm not saying something I knew there. I think most of you must have seen this. But anyway, so um, sad loads of information is a big, big problem. But when we're trying to do something uh, as high level as uh, working for equality, we should try and open up these silos and we should try and get some commonalities. And that's something that we try and work on. Now, uh, one thing that's really interesting that's happening at the moment, which is helping that a bit, is uh, there's loads of different frameworks at different levels of uh, public administration and government, local, local democracy, and all that, that are aligning themselves with each other to a certain level. So uh, at a global level, you do have uh, SDGs, uh, that is something that sustainable development goals, that inside it has indicators. A lot of it has also to do with environment and all that, which is not traditionally uh, linked in with equality work or equality data, but it actually, a lot of it goes in common. A lot of that has got to do with gender equality, but beyond that as well, we've also uh, local participation, justice and everything else. Um, in the UK, across the UK, uh, the, the main framework is the Equality Act, and then I was going to go a bit more in detail about the Equality Act later on, but it creates a, a single framework of uh, what are the protections against discrimination that set, certain sets of people have. That links with obviously equality data, I call it uh, monitoring, and, and uh, which is seen as sensitive information. In Scotland, there's the new uh, national performance framework, and that came out, it's quite small, but anyway. Um, all of these overlap. There's a lot of uh, common data uh, statistics, measures, and indicators across all of them. And us in Fife, that's us, uh, we work at a local level. What we try and do is that we take all these frameworks that tend to see things at the big picture and say, let's bring this to the ground, like, which is the, the theme of today after all. Let's, can we see this in our communities every day? Does this information that we already have, does it match the reality of the people that we know? The groups that don't turn up to big events, to PB, to you name it, all the events where it's actually accessible and you, you you see your usual suspects. We take this data and we say, does it match? And we, we interrogate uh, these communities that are left out. So that's something that we do. And we found a few things, but I'm not going to get too much into that. But it's based very much on the Equality Act. Um, I'll pass back to Nina to talk a bit about the Equality Act, maybe. Right, the Equality Act is here to kind of like strengthen and harmonize all the previous uh, equality legislations. I mean, I'm sure many of you are aware that we used to have the Race Relations Act, Sex Discrimination Act, Disability Discrimination Act, the uh, regulation for age, regulation for uh, sexual orientation and uh, so forth. And so we needed something that could harmonize and help people. Uh, to understand, uh, you know, what protections they have, um, and then so, so the, it is still a, very much about promoting a fair and more equal society, and and protect individuals from unfair treatments based on these protected characteristics: uh, age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy, and maternity, race, religion, belief, sex, and sexual orientation. So I'm sure that many of you are already quite uh, familiar with that. Uh, but if you uh, wanting to uh, find out a uh, little bit more about um, the, uh, the Equality Act or, or, or any of the protected characteristics, do, do let us know. The reason why we do kind of emphasize on the protected characteristics, because that's what govern our work. And in many ways, that kind of define the, how we section the statistics uh, in, in our the Equality in Fife uh, report. Mm -hmm. 
So I think that's okay, so. These are big themes. They are common themes. As I say, they run across all kinds of levels. There's, there's tons and tons of data available about it. Unfortunately, what we find really quickly is how do you sort this out? So how do you make sense of it? Uh, so we use a very simple uh, framework. As I say, it's the Equality and Human Rights Measurement Framework. We organize things on six domains of education, work, living standards, health, justice, personal security, and participation. And then we look at the kind of indicators that exist across all of them. And then we try and find out what's happening at Scotland level, UK level, and where we work in Fife. And then at some point down the line, if things go well, we go to work at a very, very, very local level, locality level. Uh, the problem that it does very quickly is that uh, the complexity of it is, um, is mind-boggling. Because if you imagine you're measuring educational uh, achievement of every single person, of every single age group, of every single type of disability, of every single type of sexual orientation, da -da 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 -da, it becomes astronomically uh, Researchers like a big matrix of data. It is an immense matrix of data. Uh, it is possible to do. The thing is that it's not difficult to, to, to think what it represents as a matrix. You can just say, oh, this is all the data space that exists. If we track all that, we'll be able to actually really know the state of equality, or, or at least that exists with public record, that is, public data. You know, these, are, these are technically legislated for. The thing that we find out, though, is that there's a lot of gaps. That's the main thing. We'd, we went through that exercise and we actually said, right, okay, let's find out what do we know at local level or even anywhere at any level, what do we know about, let's say, educational achievement and, let's say, uh, disability and gender. As soon as you cross them over, it disappears. The information is simply not recorded. Um, so these are just some things. I, I, as I say, I've mapped out all the stuff that we don't know. Despite uh, legislation at... Uh, UK level or Scottish government level, we don't record information, you name it. Uh, gender, maths proficiency, not only the number of enrollments uh, in STEM subjects for, for uh, disability, ethnicity and gender, but there is no publicly accessible um, information about proficiency. So if you think about it, it's as if a lot of these movements towards uh, trying to make a quality data more useful it's halfway there, it's like it's a half effort. There's a bit of, of uh, in information there, but we should just encourage the people that hold that data in their silo, say, oh, go on then, share the rest of it. Maybe you don't, have, you don't have the time to work with it, but out there, there's activists, there's like local community groups and all that, and, and charities, anyone who's actually wanting to, to try and reform and help, they would like to use this. So if you had a bit more information about math proficiency, for instance, we could create way more programs that would be creative outside of the current systems. It exists everywhere. It exists in work, in living standards. Someone has this inf information. It's just not easily, readily, publicly accessible in a way that allows and fosters innovation like in, in civic society. So this is where uh, our exercise of actually trying to find out what exists, really, when you put all these frameworks in real life at local level, there's a lot of gaps. We can do the effort of actually knocking at the council departments, the, the specific schools so that might have this information, but it is not uh, something which is done uniformly across all local authorities or uh, by principle of, in local government. It's, it's understandable, it's a lot of work, but in some ways it's like shooting yourself in the foot because you could actually use that information to actually mobilize more people around you to actually go forwards. So, uh, should we talk a bit about some things that we know, that we found out? We do encourage you to, to go on our website and uh, have a look at our Equality in Five report. It's 220 pages, so we do not advise you to print them. And, uh, and the report is updated um, every six months. Uh, and usually around that time, I kind of having to manage Eric's tantrums, you know? But, and, I, and I kind of remind him that it was him that actually said that he would do that. At no point did I <laughs> say he has to, but he, he, he wanted to do it. But I think, but I think it is like working through all the data. And so we have some 
uh, a lot of really good tables already in the report that we've um, has been quite useful for um, a, a wide range of organizations. So recently, um, I gave a presentation to about 150 employability services in, in Fife, just to kind of highlight, not about celebrating, I know that sometimes it sounds really bad, it's like, we, uh, it's good to celebrate the successes that we have, but also it's also important to remind ourselves where the gaps are. And um, as you can see with, the reason we, why we show you this slide here to show you uh, the, the kind of the, uh, the results by ethnicity, and you can see that certain groups that actually are uh, outperforming are the, the uh, kind of the white Scottish. Uh, however, but then when you look at the econom uh, economic activity, and then is kind of dropped quite significantly. Uh, among certain groups. So, uh, interestingly, I mean, Chinese probably live up to their reputations that being the school, uh, you know, kind of high achievers, and then they continue to be students. But then when you look in the five contexts, we have one university that is like St. Andrews University. So we potentially could be losing a lot of kind of, as they call it, what was it? The brain drain. Brain drain. <laughs> and, um, and so it's like we need to look beyond about again who do we have but who do we not have you know if if the employability rates suddenly drop quite significantly um you know when you look at it I, uh, again i think arabs and chinese are you know more likely to be students so does that reflect in the actual employment statistics um not really, hence that's why Scottish Government now has a, a, a separate framework to, uh, to improve the employability, uh, employability of a whole range of minority ethnic communities. So when we look at employment rate by religion, again, if you look at the, the ratio for some groups, it's kind of 50%, so it's one in two, you know, potentially unemployed and that's the the Muslim so so again could that be explained by you know Islamophobia or um, and and then when we look at the the rate of um, employment uh, gender and the pay gaps in five actually the I think the um, this one I'm not familiar yeah I think in five, we, um, the employment rates for women are lower compared to the men, you know. Um, and then also the gender pay gap is 18.9% for, uh, for women, uh, the, between female and male workers in five. So what I highlighted was in that conference was like, you know, women doing the same job, but then as we we're getting paid much less than our male counterparts. Uh, even though the actual majority of people in that conference were we, women. Um, so, so there's some things not quite right, um, you know, in terms of the local uh, stats. And then in, when they, um, I'm not saying that local stats are not quite right. In terms of like the picture it highlights, it kind of highlights that there are certain issues that we need to address because I think gender equality people often think, oh, but then we have made quite a progress with that, uh, surely. But then the reality, the stats are telling us that we still quite a lo long way to go, especially when you look in um, areas such as five. And then the student enrollment, um, on, on this side is this um, student enrollment for the five college. And you will see that it's only like 2.4% that enroll in Fife College and then that again it highlights that I mean we already know in terms of the migration by ethnicity between the age of uh, 18 to 25 uh, we already seen a lot of young people of all ethnicity kind of move out of Fife uh, probably most likely to attend university elsewhere so then if we want to cre you know create this like inclusive growth uh, within Fife, then we need to consider how to, what can we do to attract the young people to remain in Fife. Um, 
And then when you look at the uh, modern apprenticeship uptake, it's only 0.6%. Um, you know, this is quite a significant, much less than the population size uh, within five. I think the, the minor, if we look at the minority ethnic communities, it's about 4%, isn't 4 it? 4.7, yeah. So, so the uptake of the college places and modern apprenticeship uh, significant, much less. Uh, and then also then when you look at the modern apprenticeship uptake between uh, males and females, again, there's less women going into the modern apprenticeship. Okay, so these are just some extracts. I say it's like there's a lot of this information where we do profiling. We look at what's the local population supposed to be like? What is it actually like in organizations, in institutions? That we, we notice the gaps in between. Uh, a, a, big, a big theme that exists is obviously the, the pay gaps. That's something that more and more is becoming part of, uh, what I would say, a, a, a easy uh, use of equality information, that people really understand. Uh, it creates an impact, the pay gap between, uh, let's say, uh, the classic one is the gender pay gap, so we talked about that a bit earlier on. Uh, where, but there's also, the, you might have heard it this year, uh, like the, the day of the year where uh, technically women have, uh, have worked for free until they start to catch up, until the, the salary of women. So that's another way to think about it. The ways that are really powerful to actually get the message across, things aren't quite right. They really are not quite right. Now, uh, a lot of approaches to data that we have, uh, I mean, not us as organizations in general, is that we tend to just measure one characteristic of a person and then just, and then just slap on some kind of reasoning behind it. That's a big problem with that. Uh, the classic example is when you start to cross over inter intersectionality of data. So as soon as you cross over, let's say gender, oh, what, what jumped from the screen? Okay, but gender and disability. Okay, um, for instance, uh, if you have a, oh, no, that's it, yeah, it jumped. This is, so this is big ups with uh, the crossover between gender and disability. So if you have uh, a, a male, uh, non-disabled man, and a man with a work limiting phys physical disability, there's a pay advantage of 13.6%. That's actually quite what most people go, okay, that kind of makes sense. There is a certain disadvantage against disabled people in society. Somehow, it's not fair. I'm not saying it's fair. I'm just saying it's what it reflects what people think, and more or less, it makes sense. And then when you look at what happens when it's looking at women, the big gap is much smaller. Now, this is just what the data tells you. It doesn't mean you why it's actually happening. Uh, that actually, the reason why that happens, you, just take, you take one step back, there's already a pay gap between uh, men and women. So the moment that you combine it with disability, that reason behind it disappears. Um, so it's good to have this data, but it doesn't really tell you the real story. You need to have some kind of interpretation and someone who tells you what's going on. So I'll take another example, which is really quite interesting. Uh, the gap between uh, a white British man and a, non, a British born black African man is only 0.5%. So there's not that much difference, which is quite odd. Most people would say, what's happening there? But if you look at women, there's a massive pay advantage. Uh, black African women has a 19.4 pay advantage uh, to, compared to a white British woman. That sounds absolutely amazing. It's just, but that tends to be with the fact that a lot of uh, black African women are really highly educated and do extremely well. However, it doesn't tell us the story that in the UK, for instance, uh, black African women have four times the mortality rate of white uh, women. So we, have, we do this thing that we just take a snapshot of data, we use it to sell our whatever, whatever we're selling, and then we, just for, we, we forget some bits. So that's not too good. We need to do better than that. So, that's, so uh, I take a last example. Oh, I won't bore you. There's loads of examples like this. Uh, but anyway, so there's pages and pages where you, you can get the snippet of information, but we really need to start stitching it all together and then trying to get a better, fairer picture of what's going on. Oh, and no, yeah, I, have, I think it is important to point that out. I mean, the, the second one, because that was the point that I would ha yes. probably have raised. I mean, this is showing the pay gap between a white British woman and a, a, a female Pakistani migrant. 
So it's just highlighting that actually within the, you know, uh, even within uh, race equality, there are differences. And I think whereas if you compare to uh, African, uh, kind of British African, that tend to be more like London based and in big cities, because you know, in Scotland, we, we don't have a big number of the um, British born um, African uh, communities, but whereas like we do have quite a significant number of uh, uh, Pakistanis or Indians or Chinese up in Scotland. And, and you can see that actually the pay, pay gap between a white woman and a Pakistani woman is 7.9%. Uh, but that's a national figure. Mm -hmm. And what we don't have is the kind of like the local figure, uh, you know, what, what picture uh, we, we, we need to take on board. It's not that we could not get it, but it's quite complicated. We could ask for it and then that's going to create additional work on someone, but we don't want to hassle. We're already quite pressed at the ONS and, and all that. So, but it could have been made by default accessible, then you would not you would not create more work to someone to actually go and create special tables for you to actually access information. So that's just a design flaw. I think this, what we already have highlighted uh, locally is like uh, there's a lot of data that we don't systematically record. I think uh, using uh, Five Council as an example, uh, they, uh, they record uh, based on age, uh, um, gender, uh, uh, disability and ethnicity. Uh, majority of services do record those, but then they don't uh, record sexual orientation, uh, they don't record gender reassignment um, and uh, religion. These are the kind of things that they sometimes they feel people more likely to be offended uh, if people are being asked those questions. But then what we want to do is like if we ask as question systematically people because I mean I remember 20 years ago you know even when they first introduced the race category you know there was a lot of people who say I you, you can't you can't ask that or how do you categorize which um, uh, ethnic group you use but I think you know we do need to move on to help the communities to understand that as for these questions is just really to help people to design better services mm -hmm. mm. yeah so it's, it's something that we do notice. There's just loads of missing information just because it's not being recorded and then it's not being shared. So it's a big problem. We're working with it. But uh, I don't know if it's conclusions. There's a few things that I can put a few points. I've got a few points and Ina's got a few as well. Um, we could get a lot by opening up data, but the source itself is not very good. So there's a problem there especially for equality. Uh, there's a lot of questions which are diffi difficult to ask. Uh, they could lead to actually really positive policy changes, but because we don't ask the difficult questions to start with, we can't do a follow-up action later on down the line. Might it be local, uh, local government or activists or independent organizations? Um, if we have detailed equality data, we could really, really spot inti institutional barriers really easily. That's a bit of a problem. But we need to shift away from this idea I was mentioning, this like snapshot of data, just isolating a person uh, in relation to one specific characteristic. Our work is across all the protected characteristics, there's a reason for that. Uh, understanding the, the specific barriers that a person face, uh, faces in their life is not something you can just make a snapshot of. You, you need to understand where that person's, the, the, I call it the cohort movement, where that person has traveled, the barriers they have faced throughout their life. Um, and that actually creates a better understanding of uh, basically the, the inequality the person might be facing. We were talking about PB early on. Um, if you apply it to that setting, uh, imagine, that, uh, imagine a bit like the person who is extremely poor, who's got only disposable income of, let's say, five pounds, and then decides to give the five pounds to a homeless person. And then someone's got a disposable income of 10,000 pounds and decides to give five pounds to a person. The value of that five pounds is extremely much lower. And in PB, uh, if someone has had extremely low social capital, cultural capital, or even basically uh, accessibility to turn up at the event, but the choice that they make in that 
participatory action is actually of high value because we have thought very carefully or experienced extremely high barriers that actually make that decision really worthwhile. And we're missing it out because we're not making things accessible. So there's, 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 there's a problem with assigning value to decisions and then forgetting bits when they're convenient. Anyway, so uh, let's go on uh, goes on forever about it. But uh, some really interesting things that happen is uh, the gender pay gap legislation and, and move. It is very top, uh, top down. Uh, it is very much, uh, it's the law now. If you have 250 employees, you will have to report uh, your, uh, your pay gaps. You will have to report how much you pay your employees. Uh, a lot of people are gaming that system. They're trying to find ways around it. It's not perfect, but it's created a movement to actually know there's enough of this. We, we should really tackle it. it. You've seen it the past year. Ever since uh, April, there's been loads of the BBC, la -di -da -di -da. so yeah, anyway. So uh, legislation can help. We need some kind of top-down legislation. Uh, if there's a gender pay gap, well, maybe we should do it across all of them. You know, disability, race, why not? Just, just really be open about data and, and try and be brave with what it brings afterwards. And the way forward, I think Nina wanted to talk a bit about a few things. Yeah, I think uh, what, after we present the data to uh, um, people, we often ask us, like, you know, what are the, what's the way forward? What's the solutions? And I'm not particularly in favor of uh, kind of like more specialist services because uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's demand on resources when we're already talking about, you know, uh, we, uh, the, the resources are limited and uh, we, we don't really want to create, um, you know, specialist projects that depending on short term funding and then when that disappear, then, uh, um, you know, the, the, that client group, they're no longer supported by anybody because uh, even looking at the employability, uh, one of the slides that we, uh, is not on here is showing that, um, you know, the uptake of modern apprenticeships have gone up uh, with the disability groups. That is because in Fife, we actually have a dedicated project that is uh, about uh, getting more disabled people, um, modern apprenticeship placements. And, um, but then if that project is no longer there, we probably might again see the drop. So, so we need to think about what would be the long-term solution is about changing the way that we operate the mainstream. Is that, you know, does that naturally come into people's thinking in terms of if we're saying that, oh, we need to make sure our services like cater for everyone in our community. Is that what they actually genuinely have in mind? Or, or do they just consult with the people who turned up to their focus group? So 20 people, or in that case, 1,000, but then 1,000 out of 25,000. You know, so, so I think, um, and then, but I so saw it's, it's, uh, there's maybe some other issues that we do need to take into consideration if we are truly genuine about, you know, opportunities for all and that inclusive growth, growth because data tell us one thing and uh, but then what we find is like it's actually it's quite easy to ignore data as well um, because some of the pictures that we painted have been known for a long time <laughs> you know in terms of employment rate within certain communities the, uh, the pay gap between you know uh, the um, disabled and non-disabled uh, so what we're highlighting are not new issues but then how do we really genuinely use the data we know to do something about it? So, thank you. Sorry for taking longer than expected. <laughs> <laughs>